Last week we had we dealt with the, the shepherd's responsibility to the sheep and the sheep's responsibility to the shepherd. And now he goes from sheep to sheep, basically here, something including all of us in our actions towards each other. But two verses we're going to look at here, very important though, verses 14 and 15. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient to, toward all men, see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we love you. Lord, we thank you for your word. We ask your blessing upon the service tonight. Lord, I pray that you be glorified and honored in all that is said and done. Lord, please work. I pray for your help and your mercy and your grace. Lord, I pray that you control what I say and how I say it. May it draw us closer to you and be a help. Lord, I do pray if there's anyone here who has never truly been converted, Lord, I pray that even this evening they repent and place their faith in Jesus Christ. May you be glorified and honored. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. A church is made up, of course, of simply saved sinners. The moment we got saved, our flesh did not disappear. Um, we don't instantly become super Christians, and, and nor do we ever obtain, like even some Baptist churches preach, that we actually obtain to a place of sinless perfection. That never happens. Your flesh is with you. The day is coming when it comes to our sanctification, where we have a, a final sanctification. We have a progressive now in our daily walk. But one day we will have that when we're in the Lord's presence, and where our, our body is changed, and we're forever saved uh, 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 from sin. There will, that will never happen again. But right now, we are a local church, and within this local church, we are all sinners. Not a one of us in here does not have a sinful, wicked flesh that works to thwart our growth uh, in our Christian walk. It seeks to prevent us actively from glorifying God as we should. And because of this, it's true of every church, and it's true of our church, we will have problems. Um, the answer is to, uh, and for us, we have to expect those problems, and the key is, how do we handle it? I remember witnessing one time a problem in a church. I was not a member of the church. I was there visiting for a special service, and I was, I was just about stunned at what I saw. Um, a person had given a, a speech, and it was a, it was a female, a young female, um, probably about 18 years of age, I would say had given a speech, and the service went on. There was preaching and whatnot, and the service had concluded. I was sitting over off to this side. My wife was next to me, and I started to get up with everybody else that had just dismissed, and something caught my attention on the platform. The pastor had called up the, the young woman who had spoken to him. It was, he was about here, called up, and the person, you know, she was, actually was sitting back here. He called the person over, and so the pulpit was here, and, and they were standing almost toe-to-toe -to -toe like this, the pastor on this side, and the the younger female on this side, I actually sat back down. Something looked off about it. I sat back down. It was a good service. I sat back down, and Marion said, what are we doing? I said, watch this. And I proceeded to watch that young lady get reamed. I couldn't hear anything, but you could just see it. And then I saw the tears coming down her face. This is in front of everybody. I mean, the church is dismissed. No, I don't think anybody can hear anything. That, that I don't know. I mean, I was, I was a little ways back. I looked at my wife and I said, he lost her. I said, I, I don't know what she did, but whatever it was, that's not how you handle it. Right. Let's get the benefit of the doubt and say something wrong was done. I, I heard of nothing wrong spoke, not even close to it, not even gray. But let's just say something was. That's certainly not how you handle that problem. Right. It is not. Sometimes when people struggle with sin, we just want to throw them aside. Just like the Lord does us. You know, when we struggle with sin, how he just dismisses us and throws us aside. Sometimes when we see someone weak, we like to mock them or make, use that situation to make ourselves look better and more spiritual. Many times if someone offends us, we seek retribution. We seek our own and not the good of others. This all takes place, of course, when the flesh is in control. The truth is, this is very true, listen to this, one of the best measures of a church's spirituality is how it handles its problems. It's how it deals with failure. It's how it deals with the struggling, that it doesn't close a blind eye to it like the church at Corinth. 
but that it handles it in a scriptural manner with the goal of strengthening those who need strengthened. That is the key, by the way, to church growth. The Lord is not most concerned about numerical church growth. What He is concerned about most, which I hope we do, I hope we grow. I, 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 good enough, we hit 400, 500, so be it. But that's not the goal. That's not in the thing. Okay, what do we need to do to get there? That's not it. What I see in Scripture, what is key, what Paul constantly worked on, as we're getting into right now with those local churches, was the growth, spiritually speaking, of who the Lord put in that church. I mean, you look today, there's so much written about church growth today. You can find all kinds of books. I've read, I've read some of their books on them. I mean, today the popular thing is I'm an independent fundamental Baptist, and honestly, I'm stunned. I, I just, I didn't see this coming. We have multitudes of Baptist pastors attending these seminars called Idea Day, put on by a Baptist pastor. It's just how to turn your church into a worldly machine to attract more lost people to your church. It's, it's shocking to me. The changes that the churches go through when they follow this philosophy are stunning. Listen, as the world gets more and more wicked, that's not a license for us to change more and more. Right. Truth never changes. <clears throat> the Bible is the best book written on church growth. You know what? Guess what? It doesn't get into great advertising slogans. It doesn't get into great advertising programs. It doesn't get into entertainment metho uh, methodology. None of that. But Paul here does dive into some of it that deal with helping the church to genuinely grow spiritually. Paul here deals with things that hinder our growth as a church. He's dealing with relationships between each other in a local church when you have sinful people assembling together, working towards a common goal of that of glorifying God. And so I certainly think we do need to look to the Apostle Paul for the principles of church growth. How to strengthen our church, which is much more important than even numerical growth. Don't lose context of the book either. I think that's important in light of where he's going now in chapter 5. Paul has been dealing with, everything was sort of climatic, getting to chapter 4 and then into chapter 5, dealing with the return of Christ. Some confusion had come into the church regarding it, and Paul reassures them, we're not appointed to the day in wrath. Listen, those who have died, yes, they're going to be resurrected as well at this rapture. Then we're going to be caught up together. It's all going to take place. And he told them, remember what I told you. Don't, don't get away from it. Stay with it. And so he was, that's the context of it. So now, since he was dealing with the return of Christ, he's trying to get them to a place where they can actually hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now you think, as I was preparing this, I thought about this. Right now, in your life, who would say, either, either your flesh is telling you, well done, my good and faithful servant, or the Lord is telling you, well done, my good and faithful servant. So if you had to answer that right now, which one is saying it? Which one are you the servant to? Paul is trying to get it to a place where this, they can genuinely hear when he returns. Or, as we see in chapter 4, death finds them first. Where they genuinely can hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. So he deals with it in two areas here in verses 14 and 15. First, he's going to give advice in dealing with people with problems. And then secondly, advice in dealing with all people, things that apply across the board. So let's dive into the, first, the, 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 the majority of, of verse number 14, advice for dealing with people with problems. Look at uh, the, the first portion here, first three quarters of, of verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, Comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak. Let's stop there. Here we see three types of people are given. Three types of people that have problems, that have issues that need to be dealt with. And by the way, 
any local church of any reasonable size, say of 30 or more, are going to have these three types of people present. They'll go through seasons where you will have to deal with these types of problems, and it's important how we deal with these problems, with those who are struggling in these three different areas. The three different areas, if you want to write them down here, are the disruptive, the despondent, and the delicate, or the unruly, the feeble-minded, and the weak. These are people that need help spiritually. They need to be strengthened, each struggling in a different area when it comes to their walk. And this certainly can not only hinder their walk, but in turn, it hinders that local church. And we are each other's helpers. We are to bear one another's burdens. We need to work towards helping others, fixing problems, being a help. In our culture, when something's broken, we just throw it away. That same mentality seems to, have, seems to have transferred right over into the local church. I am so glad that the Lord just doesn't toss me aside. <clears throat> and so we need to try and help others to produce a genuine change. For some, it needs that paradigm shift in their thinking where they can actually see life from a different perspective, where they can actually begin to see genuine growth with the end goal of what it's about, of glorifying God with your life. It's not just saying, well, nothing you can do for them. That's just not true. When Paul starts out here in verse 14, he uses an, inter an interesting word. Now we exhort you. The word for exhort here has a sense of urgency to it. I think that's important. When you see someone needing help, don't wait. Don't let them dig the ditch bigger. Right. And notice, he's switching here. It's not only my responsibility. He's dealing with all of us in our relationship to each other, sheep to sheep. The word exhort here is interesting. It's translated several times. What was it? About 40-some times it's in the New Testament that... Greek word. Of the 40 times, by the way, it's translated in about 20 different English words. The majority of those, 20 uh, of those 40, all deal with begging. For instance, it's the same word in Romans 12.1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. The strong asking, the begging, the urgency. So Paul is stressing that here. Listen, when it comes to these issues, look to be a help. And he shows us how to be helped for each one of these groups. So let's look at the three. First off, the disruptive, the unruly, like Rosie right now. She was disruptive. We need to throw her out. No kid should ever be in a service. It's disruptive. Do you know how important it is when I speak? We laugh at that. Churches preach that exact thing that I just said. The disruptive, or as it puts it there, the unruly. The word is interesting as well. I always find it interesting diving into these words. It means careless, out of line. It is a military term. It was used to describe somebody in the Roman military who got out of line, who was derelict in his duty, who... The group was marching one way. He decided to go his own direction. So it was applied to a soldier who would not keep rank, guilty of disorderly conduct, insubordinate, disobeying orders. Think about that. No army or military unit could ever be effective it does, if it does not deal with quickly the unruly. It would break down. So much so that when you're, I spent nine years in the Air Force. So much so that when you're in the military, not only are you subject to civilian law, but you're subject to something called the UCMJ, the Uniform Code of Military Justice. I assume it's still called that today. Why do they have the UCMJ? Because in order for a military to function and be able to handle problems quickly to this higher standard because lives are on the line. There's a genuine mission at stake that's much bigger than any one individual. They need to be able to prosecute if I'm late for work. They could throw me in jail if they wanted to if I want to be tardy. Why do they go to such a high standard like that in the military? 
because of the nature of the mission, of what's at stake, we, too, are under a whole other set of laws than the world. Yet the church wants to act like we just have to abide by the same conduct. No, we don't. There's so much at stake, much more so than even in the military. There is eternity at stake with what we're dealing with. We have a high calling, and so we are held to a higher standard. So many times, this is where the disruptive, the unruly, fail to see that. It's, you know, we get taught in our, our, in our culture all the time, you need to march to your own drum. You know, it's, it's portrayed in books and movies and philosophies. Have you, ever, you, put, you, you march to your own drum as if that's a... It, listen to me. You know what life is about? Once you are saved, you've been bought with a price. It's not about marching to your own drum. It's about self-denial, seeking actively to glorify God. So this is the person, let, let's get into this based on this word here, and how that looks in the local church. And this is the person who really would have a problem with almost anything the local church does. They would be stubborn against it. It can manifest in different ways. They could be simply against the authority in the church. By the way, when, when God gives, we, you know, last week we talked about the pastor relationship. When God gives the pastoral authority, understand this, it's not political. It's not like a, a political appointee or anything of the sort. By no means. It's none of those things. It is not, nor is it, it it's not a political authority. Um, it is, it's, it's, it's not, what's, what's the other word I'm looking for? Uh, my, I completely lost my train of thought right there. It's, it's the authority that's given. It's not based on social status. It's not based on, well, we see that level of education. We see that social status. There's that level of income. Therefore, there's authority. No, it's, it's, it's simply something that's based on, spiritual, on a spiritual sense that is biblical in nature, which the Lord's setting down guidelines that are based on character, etc. That's what this is about. That's where that authority comes in. Don't look at it as something political. Don't look at it based on social status. So one way this can manifest itself would be somebody who always just wants to go against authority that's in the church. And we're talking where the authority is right. This can be the person who is simply unfaithful. Or apathetic. Really doesn't care what's going on. Just if I come, I come. If I don't, I don't. That's, that's not marching in the same line. <clears throat> they can be angry, contentious, unruly. Something's come up in the church that's just, can, just cantankerous about it. Just want to be contentious with everything. It can manifest itself in just plain laziness on purpose to the point of hurting the church. They will not want accountability and will be very critical. Many times, just looking for a reason to leave, they can get bitter. So it can take different forms. Be careful you don't fall into this. Because the truth is, any of us, we have the same sinful flesh. So this is a group, he said, you're going to have to deal with. In a local church, you're going to have those who are unruly. All right? They're, they're, they're going to be disorderly. You have to learn how to deal with that within the church. Because we have sinful flesh, it's going to happen. Just like I've mentioned this before, if you want to decide to pick apart things in this church or any church, it's easy to do. Try looking for something what's right in the church. Proverbs 14.4 says, Where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increased by the strength of the ox. You know what that means? If you're doing something, working, sometimes there's going to be a mess. If you want a church without a mess, then do nothing. Think about this. When God assembled us right here at this church here in Anchorage, he gives every single one of us that are saved have spiritual gifts given by God. Those gifts are not just random. Well, I think this is from a sovereign God 
who knows exactly who you are, who knows what church you are in. And so he gives spiritual gifts for that church. And if somebody decides they're going to be unruly or out of line with it, not marching to the same step, they don't, either they want to be faithful, just lazy, or outright disruptive, or, or angry, it can, it can manifest in these different ways that hinders that church. So Paul says, you've got to deal with that. This is about, and it's helping their, uh, their, their spiritual growth. So what are we to do here? Well, what does he say? He says this, warn them that are unruly. So we have to dive into that word warn here. Which one is used? A.T. Robertson, who is probably dives in the words as good as anybody. He said the verb means to put sense into it, to come up. This is important because it's amazing. Almost all the words here he uses for these groups somehow have the meaning of come alongside. To come alongside to put sense into their head. So it's the idea of coming alongside closely, giving warning, letting them know, listen, there's consequences, encouraging them to change direction. A gentle, compassionate warning. When you see somebody you know, that's exhibiting these different traits, it's a matter of with compassion for their spiritual growth, not for you to make a point, not for you to criticize, but to say... Say, come on, let me help you. I don't think you understand the road you're going down. It's encouraging. Please do right. Be a little bit more faith. Why don't you come Wednesday nights with me? I'll stop by and grab you. Or listen, and take him to side. Listen, brother, listen, I, I care. For, I see you're angry a lot. Man, I, I want to help you with this. Do you know where that anger is going to take you? That's not the road you want. Come on, you know that. It's giving the warning. It's not turning a blind eye to it. It's giving a compassionate warning that this is not the road you want. I remember I had this happen with a really a good man in Kudu Kudu, uh, in the work in Kudu Kudu. I led him to the Lord. We, we ended up on a, on a boat together in a supply run. He happened to be Right, right when I was getting ready to start the work in Kudu Kudu, from the village connected to it there, Rantivis. And we start talking, and anyhow, several weeks later, I lead him to the Lord. He was the guy I led to the Lord, and the bug flew in my mouth in the middle of giving him the gospel. The fly was alive, buzzing around in my sinuses and my throat. I'm not kidding. You want to know what that sounds like in your head when it's alive and buzzing, some giant fly in there? Eyes or water's just running out of him. The guy thinks I'm weeping over him. I'm not. I just can't control my tear ducts at the moment because there's a fly flying around inside my face. But he, he put his faith in Christ that day, really began to grow. It was exciting. I remember I went on my furlough. Man, he just wept like a baby when I was going on my first furlough. Middle of second term. Warning signs were coming in play. Unruliness. He wasn't disruptive. He wasn't against the authority. That's not how it was manifested. Unfaithfulness started appearing. I saw other things getting his attention. I went to him and asked him, I said, I said what, so what's going on? During that course of conversation, I found out he wanted to get a vehicle. Now, there, that's a huge deal. For a villager to have his own vehicle, and he was industrious, loved it. He was industrious, decent worker. He, he turned some of his ground for his gardens for food into a cash crop. Uh, which was what I encouraged them to do. But he was getting close to enough money to buy a vehicle. And I remember giving that gentle warning, Jonah, this is not the road you want to go down. I can already see it distracting you. This isn't it. Your kids are starting to come up now. This is not the road you want to go. <clears throat> the next, look at this here. Here's the second group, the feeble-minded. It says, comfort the feeble-minded. <clears throat> so the first group we have here was the disruptive, the unruly. The second group we have here now is the despondent. Now, feeble-minded, many times when we see this word, we think of those who are mentally challenged. It's not at all what this word is dealing with. It has no bearing whatsoever to those who are mentally challenged. Um, it does not at all. It deals with those who are despondent. And you'll understand. We're going to get into the definitions. It'll be, make perfect sense to you in just a few minutes. 
This would be those, and I'm, I'm going to throw this out throughout this, who worry all the time. It'll manifest itself in different ways. Sometimes they, they quit. Quitting can be a, uh, a manifestation of this characteristic in their life. They always look on the dark side of things. They tend to give up when things get tough. They take that as an indication. This is the end of God, I'm done. Usually they'll have trouble with criticism. They can usually get mad quickly when someone hurts their feelings. A constant worry about the future. To understand this better, it's interesting, fascinating, what the word literally means with a straight literal translation. It means little soul. Now, we don't use that term today, but in the first century, they did. Little soul. To understand the meaning of that, we're going to look at the opposite of it. All right? Um, this word, I can't remember what it is. Something like oliga, um, psyche, mega psyche is big soul, which was used for a, a positive compliment to somebody at this time. Here's what Aristotle said about a large soul. The opposite of this person. Look at it. I'm going to read two different definitions from that time frame on a large soul person. It says, the mega psyche is the man who has achieved much, claimed much, and deserves much. Another one in the meeting of large soul. It refers to the person who takes great risk because there's great principle and truth at stake. It refers to the person of courage, the person of boldness, the person who will put his life on the line for a noble cause. The person who has a sense of adventure, who loves the challenge, who seeks the competition, who loves the battle because he tastes victory. The one who is fearless in the face of difficulty, the one who is not afraid of persecution, the one who has a vision, who achieves great things because he sees every opportunity that is before him. So the person in our text at this time frame that Paul, is in the word he is using, is the opposite of this person. Little soul. So it's the opposite of those qualities is where they struggle at spiritually in their life and they need help. This is a person that fear could easily control. Worry dominates their thoughts. They will struggle with change. It'll produce fear. Wait, what are we doing? They can see, as I've already mentioned, they can usually see the bad in every situation. When I read one commentator said it like this, I laughed. He said, you, you could show them a perfect meadow field that's beautiful, and they'll find the one cow pie that's in it. They can find something wrong with anything. You know, they're going to be cutting that grass to that zero turn. It's going to go too fast now. That's what's going to happen. It's just going to go too fast for them. <clears throat> Well, then we'll let you cut it with the push mower. I'm good with that. They have what I, what I termed here as Eeyore symptoms. Eeyore. Oh, what, what do you always say? I got it wrong last time. Oh, dear. What do you always say? Oh, dear. Or, I can't remember. What? Oh, bother. That's it. Oh, bother. <laughs> This is the person with little soul. They fear failure. Do you understand why it's feeble-minded? It deals with where their thoughts are, where their mind is. This person will have trouble rising above their circumstances or rising above their problems. They will stay underneath them. It's like there's weights on them, like their soul is crushed down. Little. And you can see how can this, this could greatly hinder a Christian's life and their spiritual growth and thus hinder a local church. And we have to deal with that scripturally. I mean, did not this hinder the children of Israel from the promised land when the spies went in? You had two that saw God in it. The last became little souls. We can't do this. We saw how big the fences were. We saw how big the, the fences around the city. We saw giants in the land. They saw all the reasons why they can't do it. Instead of why it could be done through God. Listen, life has battles and life has risk. You take it. You know what? You might fail 99 of those times. Then go for the 100th.
You have to, like the sermon that I, uh, that, that I preached several years ago here, dealing when Peter got out of the boat. You have to be willing to get out of the boat. Uh, Peter amazes me in that situation. Even though, yes, he did fall, the guy got out of the boat. Are you kidding me? What an indicator that he was going to be used greatly of the Lord. So, how are we to deal with the person that is little-souled, feeble-minded? They have trouble seeing the positive. Everything just dominates and controls and the worry frets and it can lead to depression and other things in their life. It uses the word comfort of how to handle this. In other words, it doesn't say argue with them till you change them. It's not how you're going to do that. It doesn't tell me just preach at them. It's not what it says. It uses the word comfort, which means to speak encouraging, comforting words, speaking tenderly. And your words need to be with wisdom. Remember, our goal here is that person's spiritual growth, to get beyond that, to step out of that box. So often we think we have to stay in these areas. It, and, and a lot of that does come from some, from some of our modern philosophy of the day, it's, it's, you have, through Christ, you can come out of that box. That is true. As long as you believe you can't come out of it, listen to me, you never will. There will be no magical moment as long as you believe that, poof, you're out of it. That's not ever how that's going to work. <clears throat> there is power in words. We know that. We can, we can think, you, can think of, uh, uh, you can think of the child who's been battered down by dad over and over and over with words. Maybe never one hand laid on him ever, anything inappropriate like that, but just the words constantly beating down, constantly beating down. You will see that person, unless they come out above that circumstance, struggle greatly in life. Because there's power in words. The opposite needs to take place. There needs to be those tender words of encouragement to be a help, to try and strengthen, reminding them how great God is. You don't have to stay like this. You don't. But I don't know what to do. And you encourage, trust the Lord. Day by, just moment by moment, day by day. That's what you do. Each moment you're given, that's your life. It's so often that those within this group and struggling in this way spiritually, though they believe God and know He's there and even can have a love for Him, yet they fail to put that into everyday life and practical circumstances as if God doesn't help there. But He does. So with this group, it's so important that we work to encourage, to speak tenderly when you see it, to help the other sheep. And then the third group he gives us here, support the weak, the delicate. Third D, delicate, the weak. <clears throat> this is not dealing, of course, with physical weakness, but with spiritual weakness. Spiritual weakness can manifest biblically in two ways. I'll cover, the first, I'll, I'll cover them both. First, we see it scripturally with those who are, well, I'll, I'll give you the two ways first. Those who are weak in the faith and those who are weak morally. All right? So spiritual weakness will, will, will give evidence in, in those two ways if it's, if it's in place. One might struggle with weak in faith. One might struggle with weak in morality. All right? The weak in faith is what Paul dealt with, for instance, with those like the meat offered to idols. That person is weak in faith. They thought it was a sin if you ate it. Now, like Paul said, the meat is nothing. It's just meat because it, offered, it did nothing to it. There's no magical power here. The idol is a dead piece of wood. There's nothing to it. And, 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 but he pointed out, however, he said, listen, don't use your liberty to be a hindrance, a stumbling block to others. Because you had those who believed, no, that was a sin. 
even though it wasn't. And Paul said those were the weak in faith. And, and you have to understand where they're coming from, too. I, I, think, I think that's one of Paul's points is many of those who were of that mindset that you can't do that, they came out of the paganism. And, and their mind, different than like Paul, who did not come out of that. Paul came out of Judaism. But in their mind, that reminded them of their wicked life. And the, the enormous immorality that went along with that. So weak in faith sometimes can exhibit itself by even there. Even, even thinking some things are sinful that aren't sinful. Or it's this weakness can spiritually bring upon themselves, in other words, burdens you don't even need to carry. This can lead to burnout, getting just so worn out with the Christian life. Frustration. And we need to help those. More so, I think this deals with those who are morally weak. These are the weak people that, you know, you barely pick them up again and they fall right back down. You pick them up again and they fall right back down. These are those who come forward in all sincerity, wanting to do right, falling on their knees before God, not being a hypocrite whatsoever, wanting to do right. Lord, please, I want my life about you. And they mean it. A couple weeks later, they fall down again. There's a spiritual, genuine weakness that is present. <clears throat> And we need to help. This isn't cast aside. This isn't, you know, we need to help. And he gives the instruction. That this is what he says. Support the weak. The word support is great. You know what it means? Hold fast. Hold fast. The imagery that came to my mind, I didn't read it, was like somebody hanging over a cliff and you have them. Don't let go. Hold on. Don't let go. If you know those who are struggling in this way, look to be help. Look to support them how you can to help them to grow spiritually. Don't let them go. The word for support has the idea to mean faithfully care for. Keep close by. I remember I read that. The word that came to mind instantly was help provide accountability. Help provide account. You know, the world's even grabbed on that philosophy and helping those. Those who enter AA and different drug rehab programs and try and use that very concept to be the help they need in the weakness that they have. It's not a matter of saying, yeah, just, just pull your pants up like a man and take it. You know what? Before you consider yourself too high, you could be in that same situation just like that. Have something grab you, hold you, and control you. And you know what you're going to need at that moment? Help. Help. Hold fast. Peter said this to the Lord dealing with, and we can apply it to this situation. I think, I think it's correct. Because Peter dealt with a brother of He said, how, long, how often shall I forgive my brother? Seven times? And the Lord said, no, 70 times seven. 70 times seven. You hold fast. If they have that repentance they're wanting to get right, you help them find out you got this. Here, what can we do to try and help you? Look to be that help. Look to be that accountability. And people need that. And Tim, I don't think you mind bringing up with your son. When he was here, and I think I mentioned this before, I'm not, I'm not sure, I think I have from the pulpit, I'm not sure, and I don't think you'll mind me saying this at all. And uh, when he was here, I remember he came to me one time after a minute of faith and let me know of a struggle he was having. And a, a substance that was control me. And so I said, well, let, let's try and work out some accountability. When's, and we, we talked. When, when does it hit? So I, I said, sometimes when I'm coming home, that's usually it. I can pull right off into a bar or pull off somewhere else like that. And I said, you know what? When you're getting ready to go, you call me. And I said, before you leave, I'll be there and I'll follow you home. You know what? While I was here, it worked. He'd text, whoop, I'd run over there, whoop, follow him to he got to his house. Boom. 
close by. You see somebody struggling at that? Hold fast. Try and be the help. You that are weak, you that are strong, ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. Help. <clears throat> and then lastly, I'll cover this very quickly. Verse 15 is, that, that was the bulk of the message, but I, I do need to get in, in, into 14 and into 15. He changes gears here a little bit. Now he's giving advice, not to those simply with problems, but how we deal with all men. All right? He dealt with the three problem groups. Um, from, uh, from the disorderly, despondent, um, and uh, the delicate. And then he says this, Be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. So now he switches, as you notice, it's, it's three times are done with all men. All men, verse 14, none render unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. So here's how we're to deal with all men. One, you're to be patient. Especially when we're dealing with those three groups, you know what you're going to need? Patience. 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 Be patient towards all men. You can see the need for this. When you're trying to help the weak, the spiritually weak, and needing patience, or the unruly, and needing patience. When helping the feeble-minded, and needing patience, it can get incredibly frustrating. You can find yourself getting angry. We need patience. We need patience. I remember, and that was a genuine hurt on my own, when I am training the man to be pastor of the work in Kudu Kudu, years of training into the fella. And in one moment, boop, all gone. That was frustrating. That was disheartening. But I needed patience. Thankfully, by the way, he's still in church still faithful, doing what's right. Not the pastor, but he is there. It takes patience. I am so glad the Lord is patient with me. We need to show patience with others. Then he goes on in verse 15, see that none render evil for evil unto any man. Ah, no revenge. We love to retaliate. We love to, and this follows our, our sinful flesh, our own nature. Somebody does us wrong, I'll show you. We love to do that. It's in us. This one here, if you're going to do that, this is denying yourself. Because remember, I talked about this in the Sermon on the Mount when it comes to uh, eye for an eye and a, a, you know, tooth for tooth. That, that's, that's, not, that's not giving permission at all for vengeance or revenge, ever. It was never meant that way. That was meant for a legal, it was a law for a legal system in an organized community. So civil law, which is the oldest law in existence, is that law. What, the point of that entire law was this. It did not allow a judge to issue punishment that exceeded the crime. Because that would happen. We do that all the time in our own relationships with each other. You offend me. When we offend back and we take our revenge, it's always at a greater level. New Guinea, just happened this last week in New Guinea. Up in the uh, main island, northern region, uh, where was it? WeWAC, it happened? Volleyball game was taking place, was it Saturday, I think? Volleyball game was taking place in a village. Turned into a fight. One person got hit, another person got hit. And, I would, and remember, revenge there is so huge. It's huge. Come Monday, I think 11 were murdered. Um, houses burned to the ground. You know what happens? Because when somebody does us wrong, we take it to another level. Then they take it to another level. Then they take it to another level. You leave vengeance to the Lord. You leave vengeance. You know what you do? It tells you, you do good to all men. You know how we overcome evil? What does Romans say? By the way, as you know, it just parallels greatly what Paul says in Romans. You overcome evil with good. You trust the Lord with the vengeance. You want to know why? The Lord has perfect justice. You don't. You don't. He has perfect justice. When He responds, it's right. And it's perfect. He knows if there's mitigating. He knows the true heart of the other person. You don't. 
You don't know what they're facing. You don't know what they went through. You don't know what generally going on in their mind. You assume you do. And then you take your retribution. But it's unjust. We leave vengeance to the Lord. That's what we do. We do good to all men. And you look for those opportunities to do good. Especially those, I mean, it's, it's true of all, but especially those who offend you, look to do good. You'll be amazed at how, how that whew, lessens a situation. It's amazing how it lessens a situation. With heads bowed and eyes closed. Now, let me ask this right now. I want you to think about this. If you're to die right now, do you know where you're going? Do you know for certain that heaven is your home because your soul will depart your body? Do you know where you're going? One day you'll stand before God in judgment. And just like me, you have broken his law. And if you are found guilty, you will be cast into a lake of fire. There's only one way out of that judgment. That is through Jesus Christ and what he did for you. Jesus Christ, God became a man 2,000 years ago to save you from that judgment. He came to this earth 2,000 years ago so you could stand before God and it might look as if, it will look as if you are perfect. He lived the perfect life for you. When he went to that cross, he took all of your sin upon himself. He died in your place. He suffered your penalty, but held it, hold him. On the third day, he defeated death and rose again from the dead. Salvation is only in Christ. If you're here right now, say, Pastor, please do pray for me. I don't know that heaven is my home. I'm not positive what's going to happen when I die. I hear you, and I'm not sure. Please pray for me. If that you, would you just raise your hand if that's you? I see some small children. That, that's all I see. Anybody else? All right, Christian. If the Lord worked on your heart, you come and pray. Father in heaven, I pray that you bless this invitation. Work in hearts and lives. I pray this in Christ's name.